So, uh, welcome everybody, good morning for this uh, workshop on Open Science and Research Data Management. Thank you for breaking the rain and being here. No, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> 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 okay. uh, thanks for breaking the rain and coming here. Uh, so, what we're going to talk today is a little bit about, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about Open Science and Research Data Management among researchers, that it's something that's going to get them. But uh, I'm here to tell that that's not the case. It's actually very good for you and why you should do it and why we need to work in this direction. So um, today's content is going to be like missing, busting some myths uh, in the, about open science in Arnia and why exactly we need open science and research data management uh, and uh, selfish benefits for researchers. So it's not just for the society but also for the researchers themselves. And while doing so, I'm also going to give some practical tips and tricks to what you can do in your day-to-day -day research uh, cycle to improve your impact, improve your efficiency, etc. And after this, uh, I forgot to mention that I'm doing this workshop in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Federica Kukuleki. Sorry, uh, she's she's director's advisor of Open Science, so I'm, I'm here on her behalf, and I'm working together with our library colleagues and our research office colleagues and as well as our IT colleagues to prepare this workshop. So let's uh, hope we have an interesting session. And uh, I like to uh, be a bit interactive. So if you have questions, don't uh, hesitate to leave at the end. Just raise your hand and we can talk. You know, it's, it's an interactive workshop. So um, today's slides will be available already on uh, this link. Uh, of course, I will uh, make sure that whoever has registered will receive a copy. But if you want, uh, there is the DOI, the Digital Object Identifier. There's also the easy link. You can already look at them right now. Um, and I have to particularly thank my pro former colleagues uh, on whose work I've built on. Uh, I'm a former researcher. I am a researcher. Uh, I, I, I believe in standing on top of the shoulders of giants. So I always try to attribute uh, whatever we do uh, on previous work. So who am I? I am uh, the brand new Open Science RDM uh, fellow, Polytechnic one, super new, really excited to be here. Uh, before, I worked on a similar role at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands until uh, six months ago. Uh, and um, what I was doing there was to actually help researchers to figure out all the data and uh, open science issues on their data -day research. And uh, I have about seven years of research experience, both as a PhD and a postdoc. Uh, in a very multidisciplinary uh, environment. And, and now I'm also a co-founder uh, of a company at I3B in the Technical. So I do this job two days a week. So uh, I, I really like open science, so I'm really excited uh, to take this upon. And I also like to stay uh, with researchers and students and learn. So I really like it. And just to finish about me, um, I'm also a certified information privacy professional, which means that uh, I know a thing or two about dealing with uh, sensitive personal data as well. So, uh, enough about me, let's talk about open science, right? So, uh, just a quick, um, oh, okay. a little intro, just I told a lot about me, I would like to know a little bit about you, we are a small group, very cozy. Uh, how many of you are researchers here? Yes, yes, PhD research. I mean, uh, what I mean is, uh, okay. So we are about half and half. Okay, very nice. So, uh, and, and uh, uh, the rest of you are, I know, you're from the library and uh, library yeah. too. Yes. 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 Very nice. Uh, I, I would like to take this moment for the researchers to, t uh, to tell to the researchers that librarians are so important in this field. You might not think how much, I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> Um, and especially, this question is more for the researchers. Uh, now I know a little bit about who you are. Uh, one of you over there, uh, what comes to your mind when you think about open science? So what's the first thing that comes to your mind? I I'm talking to the researchers, whoever they are. <laughs> one of you. Uh, 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 no, no, it's 
to mind uh, requirements from uh, the European uh, I mean, <laughs> yes. problems. So, something like bureaucracy, right? Okay. You, you are very enthusiastic. Come on. <laughs> what comes to your mind? When other answers? What is open science? What comes to your mind? Federica, what comes to your mind? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stuff. <coughs> so the idea of, uh, I, I get that the good part. The idea of no, the bad part. The bad part. The bad good part, part. I'm going to say. <laughs> Part is maybe that the researchers uh, perceive me as uh, some other uh, work to be carried out uh, within their research work. Okay. And, and the research itself as well. Open science. What is open science? Nobody knows the answer properly, right? Uh, the library. Yes. The library is, is uh, an institution open. Open. Oh, then open science is uh, uh, naturally equivalent for library. Okay. So, uh, in my experience, I've noticed that the, the even definition of open science is kind of a bit fuzzy for researchers. So, what is open science? Is it open data? Is it the bureaucracy from H2020? Mm -hmm. Is it data management? Like, what is open science? Open source software? What is it? So, we're going to talk about it. What is open science? First of all, the first myth which I'm going to work on, if my technology permits me, okay, go. or researchers especially think is that open science means open data, opening everything up, sharing everything. It is not completely true. Open science is much more than open data because open science means firstly evidence-based results. You need to show that whatever results you got have some evidence behind them. It means that you can reproduce the results or reproduce your methods or your studies and it's all about research rigor, robust research, validation and verification, and all of the things that basically define science. Open science is just science, done right. So uh, this is a beautiful sticker by uh, John Tennant. He's a, a proponent of open science. You can even download the sticker. I, I, I forgot to put it on my laptop, but I usually do this. So open science is science done right, because and if open science is science done right, why are we talking now about open science? Why is it such a new topic of research data management? It's because of a number of things. First of all, can you see the difference between these pictures? Okay, so that's the problem right now. Because we are in a, an environment where publishing is so important for your academic career. You need to publish, 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 no matter what. So that, that's how we've evolved. We started with publishing all the important results to publish or perish, publish in high impact journals, H Factor, I, I 10 Factor, all that stuff, and the high impact factors. And then, and right now, you don't even know if you're going to perish or not, even if you do that. So that's, that's where we are. And why did we get there? You know, research is not just about publishing, it's about collecting data, analyzing it, writing your results up. Uh, of course, publishing is a part of it. It's, it's also about reuse, about people having an impact of it. But the only thing that is being incentivized in today's academia is publishing. This is the only thing, because it's easy to look at, right? Number of papers, number of citations, H index, citation index. So we are in this environment right now. So that means that trying to publish positive results, not negative results. Negative results are also very important in academia. Trying to publish positive results is so high that there is this concept of uh, harking, hypothesizing after receiving the results. You know, 
like you get an interesting result and then you hypothesize around it. So and there is, you know, if you confess your data enough, it will. If you torture your data enough, it will confess. You will get your p-value somehow, right? And then you can write a beautiful manuscript, and it's a rat race to go to the biggest uh, uh, journals, and you know, because they want the life-changing. We're going to cure cancer tomorrow, you know. So this kind of stuff. This is this is a problem. There are some major consequences for this. I can give you an example. Uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, uh, this gentleman uh, was a former professor at Dierdijk Stockel. He was a very renowned uh, psychologist. And he, he, he was so pressurized to publish that uh, he wanted to, and he was publishing in Nature, he was publishing in all the big, big ones. Um, and he decided that to keep up his reputation, uh, he started fabricating data. And his PhD students actually found that out, uh, unfortunately for them. Uh, he was stripped with the titles and uh, so this was a massive fraud in the Netherlands, and, and, and the, everybody, they had a watershed moment. Okay, what's happening now? Like, what, I mean, are, are, are we, uh, but where have we arrived? And thankfully, I have to thank him for all the efforts of open science that's happening in the Netherlands, <laughs> partially. Uh, so that's when people started thinking, okay, it's not just the publication that's a matter, we need to look into the whole uh, cycle. I, Fraud happens in academia, but very little. Only one percent, two percent. You know, researchers don't want to do fraud. They want to do. Good. They want to do people. They they have a certain sense of ethics, but it's it's not mostly fraud. It's actually mainly about sloppy science. Actually, doing a study, coming up with a result, publishing, going to the next one, and because of this, there is a massive uh, reproducibility crisis. That means that the uh, experiments or the results produced by one research group is not being able to be reproduced by another one. Even forget about the other group, even the same researcher was not able to reproduce their own results. And uh, Nature uh, that did, did, did this survey for more than 15,000 researchers, they asked, do you think there is a reproducibility crisis in science? If you say 52% says significant crisis, and 38% says slight crisis. Slight crisis is like slightly pregnant, right? <laughs> and, uh, so more than 90 percent uh, or almost 90% um, think that there is a significant crisis in science. And, and, and funding bodies are taking note of this. We are giving you a lot of money, and is this what we get? That's, that's one of the things. So um, one of the main reasons for the crisis, that also in the same report, was that selective reporting, like I said, only publishing positive results, uh, insufficient uh, supervision and training, that's a systematic issue. Uh, pressure to publish, uh, again, is also a systematic issue. However, the thing a researcher can do, which is also the main uh, issue, is uh, providing supporting data, methods, and code for your results. It's just evidence for your results. How did you get this beautiful graph? Can you point to me which data set you use? As a person. So, a lot of funding bodies are taking uh, note of this. Almost all major funding bodies in Europe and the UK, including an American Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they are focusing on open science. We would like evidence-based research, we would like transparent research, we would like reproducible research. So if you are asking us for funds, show that you're doing science the right way. That's all they're asking. And there's a lot of focus on fair data. Today we're not going to talk a lot of fair data because that will mean a whole workshop on its own, a data management plan, all that will happen in another workshop. But just to give you uh, an idea of fair, what is fair is findable, accessible, interoperable, and re reusable. Findable is like, can you actually find your own files by yourself or others? This can be in this can be applied to either an individual researcher or also to others. Accessible, that means are you putting it on a website and two days later uh, the link is broken? Or can you always reach this link? So it's about persistent identifiers, having a link to your data set that is always fine, always accessible. It's somewhere and it's not broken by uh, a bad maintenance or uh, you leave the university and your email ID doesn't work, you know, that doesn't happen. And then interoperable. Is this file or data only working in your computer, not not anybody else's? Can somebody else take it and use it as well? Or is it such a specific software that it, it just cannot leave your computer and uh, not reproduce the results anywhere else? And the third one, the fourth one is reusable. That means 
If you want to reuse the data, uh, you need to describe it, like how to reuse it, and also give a license to it. How do you reuse it? What are the conditions for you to reuse it? How to cite it? Who can use it? How to report it? So the fair data does not mean open data. You can still have a closed data set and have your data fair. So, so open science means more on fair data than open data. So you can still have embargoes on data. Some data cannot be shared. What if you're working with companies? What if you're working with um, um, personal data? You can, of course, publish them. However, you can make them fair. And probably, for personal data, you might need to do some due diligence for like, find some contracts and then share the data. Or for uh, pa commercial partners, it's a completely different story. So fair is not equal to open, and open science is not equal to open data. That's what I was trying to say. And um, to do all this, to do fair, to do open science, to do all these beautiful things, uh, we cannot do this with uh, research data management. We need to manage data from the beginning, right from the collection, right from when we think of collecting the data, analyzing them, storing them, sharing them, uh, manipulating them uh, in a good way, sorry, processing them, manipulating is a bad word. Uh, processing them, and in every step, uh, you, you have to think about data management in your research uh, cycles. Uh, and it's not, sim uh, it's not simple, but it's crucial, because um, since I said, right, we've only been focusing on publishing, publishing, publishing. So we just completely forget about the reason why you are publishing, on, on top of the foundations on which we are publishing. So uh, this all uh, has different dimensions. This is data management, it's not just about technology, it's not just about uh, doing things right, but it's also about the policy around you, the awareness around you, how much. So it's, it's a kind of a socio-technical topic, but we're going to talk about this in a minute. So that's the first myth I was trying to bust. Open science is not equal to open data, and it's, called, it's more on fair data. And if you're interested, there will be a workshop soon on fair data and information plans in the future, very soon. And we are in a technical university, right? And research data management and open science is not just about data. It's also about code. How many of you use software for your research? All of you, right? All of you. And you also uh, probably write a quick script to run a uh, hair cleaning or visualization. And that, you think uh, the same script would run 20 years from now and produce the same results, you know? So, it's not just about data, and you cannot take one thing from the other. Uh, it's also about software, and, and I worked very closely with Software Sustainability <coughs> Institute in the UK, and they, they, have, they have this focus, like we cannot take one thing from the other, especially the University of Technologies, especially. Uh, not just them, even digital humanities, historians who actually use software for data, they, they need to think about it. And uh, they say 56% develop their own software, even writing small scripts, for instance, uh, if you consider the uh, software. And half of them don't have no training in software development. So it's a quick fix thing. Okay, let's quickly do this, get the result, get a nice graph, let's go to the next one. And we, we did a quick workshop last year about with researchers, so what do you mean by software reproducibility? It's because it's a new term, right? People always think research data management into uh, reproducibility of uh, results, and we, we talked about workflows, how do we set up your workflow, um, using open source software, using GitHub for version control, um, about uh, documentation, writing good comments, you know, like, uh, there are a lot of using markdown files. So, um, software reproducibility is as important, if not more, than uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, the general notion of reproducibility given our digital world. And there was even a report that says that especially the computer science, applied mathematics, and material science faculties, this is a very, very important, plays an extremely important role in the open science uh, field. Um, that's myth number one. So we talked about open data can be a lot of things. Open science is uh, in software as well. Uh, it's about reproducibility. Now the second one, that was the first comment I heard, open science and this data management are only for the benefit of others. Oh, they're asking me to do this uh, paperwork. I'm already doing a million things. Another paperwork. It's, 
I'm going to show you, firstly, it's not paperwork, actually. It's, it's just one thing you need to do at the end of the project. It's, it's something you do every day. And I'm going to prove to you that the biggest beneficiaries of open science and research data management are you, researchers. It's not European Commission. It's not Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's not ERC. It's not Welcome Trust in the UK. It's you as researchers. It's not only the society. Yes, the society also. And we all know, and we all know that open science and research data management are, are good for the society, right? Like, uh, it will improve your work, your <coughs> citations, your, um, it, it's an excellent way for the taxpayers to understand how their money is being spent, if they can see the data. All these societal benefits are, everybody knows this, right? It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. But today, we're going to talk about selfish benefits. How do we avoid um, uh, disasters with open science? We're going to talk about multiple selfish benefits that you as researchers will have if you practice open science. And let's start with avoiding disasters. I think, uh, sorry for you. I have three um, red, a red, orange, and a, a green one. I don't think you can read it from it. The first one is like you start swearing. Okay? And the second one is like, mm, okay, it, it hurts, but I can manage. And the green means, hey, easy peasy. I don't need to get so The first question What happens if your laptop gets stolen? Who, who goes for the red? And what happens if you lose your USB stick or hard drive? You know, USB hard drive is the same thing. Oh, you're all very good. Uh, who uses USB, right? <laughs> what happens? Oh, yeah, the same thing. What are the hard drive damage? No? Orange. Right. Okay, and what happens if your stuff from Dropbox or Google Drive disappears to you? <laughs> Netherlands and also in the US. 
So sometimes when I was running in the US, the server was in the Netherlands, so there would be some connection issues and I would, the quality of my data would be lost. So I wouldn't be sure if the reported measure was the same as the registered measure because of the, uh, the trans. And I literally had to hire a research assistant to write down manually the things to compare if the registered results were same. Because uh, you never know, just because it's on a computer doesn't mean that it's true, based on how you design the results. And also, I had to use a, a kind of a software um, that, that was not online, so I had to install it on every computer, collect the results from every computer, and sometimes I'm really confused which computer I'm actually connected from, and because I had to anonymize the study, I couldn't take the details of parts. And then, all of this combined, I had to work with survey results, which were also online, and also interview results. And I had to bring all this together over a period of four years. And I was lost at the end of four years, really. It, it took me so much time to just retrieve one experiment, the other experiment, making these connections. I was like, why did I start thinking about this from the beginning? That was my thing. And the other thing that happened was, my own experience was that I, I, I named me as a first year PhD student, I started using the commercial survey monthly tool to send around surveys uh, in 2012. And uh, two years later, I was writing a paper and I wanted to download uh, the data. And it tells me I need to pay 450 euros to download an Excel file. So I it's my data. I collected it. Why are you having? Because of course I have uh, agreed to all the conditions. I can only look at my data, but if I want to download it as an Excel file, no, no, no. So I couldn't access my own data. This can happen. Okay? So it's not bureaucracy, it's just your research. So that's why you need to have a very good data backup strategy. Uh, usually, usually <laughs> departmental and institutional backup system is the best because they usually have um, uh, uh, a second backup, not in the same location, but probably in the third location, geography in the third location. Uh, external drives, online backups, all are good. Uh, the, 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 the idea is to have two backups at two different locations. That's kind of the uh, rule of thumb. Uh, and again, don't leave it to Google. When I say Google, don't leave it to commercial partners because you never know how your data will end up. And what if in two, two years from now they say, no, we're going to close unless you pay or you might have restrictions. So if you read the Google Terms of Service, if you have a Google Business account, it's a completely different story. But if you have a normal Google account, like most of us do, it says, when you upload, submit, store, send, or receive content, and it can be anything, data, or otherwise, uh, you give Google a worldwide license to use, host, store, reproduce, modify, create, whatever it works, and uh, communicate, publish, publicly perform, publicly display. They can do whatever they want, even after you stop using their services. Okay? So this is the issue with commercial partners. Of course, they work really well for things. You have to use them, but don't only use them. I think they're coordinated. That's what I was trying to say. And you may be surprised, I was also very nicely surprised, that quality technical has a lot to offer in this. Uh, they have a lot of infrastructure for backup. If you actually request backup, they can have a backup locally. And also, it's this city. So if something happens here, you will have to see the version. So, and they have, um, you can store data in their data centers. They have virtual machines that you can use. Uh, they have a strategy of backing up your data until six months. So if you lose a file, you can retrieve it in six months if you had requested for the backup. And they also take a picture of your virtual machine, of your computer, to, to see what's there. For, and they keep the backup for six months. And if you request it, uh, there, there, there's also a secure cloud uh, um, services for you to um, work with. There, there's a lot of infrastructure uh, which you can use, which is available locally. Which is also important because when you're actually writing grants, if you already prove that you have existing infrastructure to deal with storage issues, you don't even really have to account for the cost because it's already on the overhead, the institution overhead. That also includes your choices. And in terms of cloud and big data and HPC and performance computing, there, there's a lot in Polytechnic already. And I should thank uh, Enrico Venuto, who is from the area IT, who provided me this information and he will. Uh, give us some more information in the coming days so we can uh, work together on how to disseminate this more effectively to researchers. And um, we will, after the selfish benefit of 
course, we take a little, um, um, no, we, we, are, we are quite, uh, quite good <clears throat> about being uh, smart, efficient, and professional. Uh, I have some issues with this. Oh, yeah. Question. What if somebody asks you for data that supports your publication? Right now. You wrote a publication. Somebody says, oh, which data do you use for it? Can you answer? I still have you. Yeah, I have two notes. One. <laughs> okay. So, okay, perfect. It's okay. Uh, the second question. What if somebody asks you five years from now?
uh, uh, you, you have for each project you have four levels. One is on the project management, on the admin stuff, finances, travels, uh, bills, and then if you need to go for uh, ethics, is a bit of a less of a topic here. But in the U.S. especially, you always need to have institutional uh, approval for any studies related to human beings. Uh, and, and then you have uh, a folder for different experiments, so whatever experiments you've done or simulations that you've done, name them. Uh, and then what are your inputs? What's your data? What is the data analysis and output? It's just saving the files in the right folders, you know. That's data management. That's it. <laughs> no, not really. Um, and then you have, then you can have your disseminations, your presentations, your publications, and then the ones you do more for publicity. This is just an example. There are so many other folder organization uh, strategies, but pick one. Don't do many things, uh, many folder organizations, and then you can do. Just be consistent. With, uh, choose one, continue like that. And to name files, name your files in a way that not just human beings, but also machines can read them. So when you actually look for your file, your computer should understand what you're looking for. So uh, it could be as simple as, okay, you know, having a date, you know. Having a date as well, simple as having a date on your file is, makes your life so easy. What's the latest version? Even if you have put the version, date will help you. Of course, then put the version number, which are version you're working on, and uh, name the document, use the camel convention, you know, big uh, uh, capital letters, small letters, and have a prefix for the type of uh, document. Is it a report? Is it a presentation? Is it a um, uh, paper, have a prefix, so all of them will be neatly lined up, so you know what is what. So also for you, it looks very professional and neat and easy to find, oh, this, okay, today my presentation is named as Presentation Open Science Workshop Torino, today's date, dot PPT. So the pre version number, of course, was at the end of the end, not before the no, date. Uh, uh, like I said, this is, maybe this is a stupid convention, of course, and also there are people who argue about the uh, date as well. Uh, but as a computer scientist, they always it's year, month, and day. <laughs> it's, it's, you, if you decide to use the version, so please do that. No, it's fine. I'm, I'm just saying that this is an example. You can create your own system. There are also many file naming systems that you can start using. Or you, you can think of your own. And, but uh, yeah. all this is very nice and it's uh, something which would be mandatory. Just like we should take classes and uh, we should learn more about, I don't know, how to teach students, because this is part of the job which is totally under uh, mm -hmm. regard from the point of view, also from the point of view of your mm -hmm. The same, we should actually take these kind of classes about uh, the combo style, management of data, and so on. And this is something which, okay, if you are inclined to do that, uh, you do so without uh, so. But uh, I appreciate this. <coughs> but uh, the end point would be something, a set of uh, 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 abilities and of tools and so on and so forth, which were, could be hopefully useful for open science, but could also be used totally for a closed environment where you don't want to share and just you want to gain, let's say, competitive advantage of, over your, let's say. Totally, list. totally. And completely. For example, you can have a Git. Git version, a Git lab version, you can have a local private repository, still version the software very well, and keep it within yourselves to work together, right? Yes. Yeah, so it doesn't need to be open, that's what I was so trying to say. This is something everybody should, should do. do. If they don't, well, that's uh, the problem. Yes. But yes, <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, uh, the point with open science is something sharing those. Uh, so, what's where open means yes, 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 I, 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 will, I will get there also. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is, this is, because today, today's workshop was also like talking to researchers that it's, it's not just for others, it's also for yourself. Think about yourself mm -hmm. first. But we, we will of course talk about that later as well. And uh, regarding uh, your impact, right? You always talk about, okay, if I'm sharing my data set for the rest of the world, uh, who looks into that? Well, Google does. You can actually test for data sets. There is Google data sets as well. And you can actually um, publish not just your data sets, you can also publish your presentations. So this was one presentation that I did a uh, long time ago. 
And just because it was, I, I just, uh, some of my colleagues put it on Twitter, and you have 2,000 views and 410 downloads just because it was so easy to share. You have a link, you share it, people just look at it. And when you go for conferences, when you go for workshops, just put your publication, <coughs> whatever slides you're going to do, on Zenodo uh, or any other repository, and then uh, share it on LinkedIn or uh, Twitter or to your colleagues, and people will just look at it. Otherwise, uh, uh, how do you share this, right? Like, And it's just one... Uh, Link and it will always be there, and you can cite it because if you look for it, you can actually say uh, when when you use somebody's presentation instead of saying uh, using X Y Z, you can just put a link below a DOI, digital object identifier, and you get a DOI for this. You can publish your presentations, you can publish your data to increase your impact uh, in a repository. You can link your publications to the data set. So this is an example of a data set. Uh, that links the publication, it's a bit too small for you to see. Uh, and then you give the license, this is how you can use my data set, this is what my data set is about, etc. And you can also track your impact, you can actually cite the data set as well. So even if people are not using your publication, they can actually look into your data and they can directly cite your data set. Uh, so instead of actually putting your data set together with a publication, if you put it in a repository separately, you can uh, Actually, refer to the, the, this graph I used was based on this data set. So it's easy to cite, it's easy to share and collaborate and cite. So, in this way, you can also increase your impact in, uh, in uh, dissemination. And you can also publish your code. You can make your code citable, like we just talked about. Everybody uses software. And if you want to say which script was used for which graph, uh, and now there is a very nice button on GitHub if you are using GitHub. Uh, you can push to Zenodo, which is a repository, and it, it will create you a DOI for your code, and you can cite that code. So, code also is set. Um, there is a, excuse me, there is something about, about this. I mean, yeah. okay sharing the code and okay sharing some simple way to yeah. visualize and to reuse this. Yes. This is fine, and I perfectly agree with this. But, I, in my research, is mostly developing codes. So, right. so this is my, uh, right. how can I say it? my business, my core business. If I give my code, I give everything of what I have. But no, uh, for instance, if someone is experimenting, I don't know him, he cannot put in the website his instrument because uh, it's something which, uh, I mean, uh, this is something unfair because um, I do not have back uh, Everything I, I give, but it's uh, it's quite a. Lot. This no, is. No, I, I, I mean, I, you, you have to convince me. To yes. Yes. Yeah, no. 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 I'm, I'm, okay. I, I can. I can ask you, I can do one thing for you right now. I don't have the internet right now. I, I, I'll show you one example from yesterday, actually. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, you as a researcher have spent a lot of time. You need to get credit for what you're doing. That's what you're doing. Like, you don't want others to. Benefits. It's like freeloaders. People are going to take your work and uh, let you work for it. And why should I give away my work? It's completely reasonable, and you shouldn't. You should have the first advantage of publishing over it. What I'm trying to say is, if you do publish about your work, you need to show the evidence. That's all I'm asking you. I'm not asking you to say, I do my experiment today, I'm going to publish it tomorrow. No, that's that's actually the opposite of what you should do. You should actually. What if you are patented? You should actually not publish it until you patent. I'm not saying that you should publish immediately. I'm just saying that when you when you are sharing your stuff, uh, you need to do it in space and you need to do it. Uh, and if you're working for, uh, let's say, a European project, you're probably even mandated to do it because uh, that's what the funders require as well. So there are three things. Uh, if you want to, like the whole open source project, think about it. 20 years ago, do you think, have, did you imagine that Microsoft would ever go open source? 20 years ago, they were, they were like, uh, Bill Gates was calling open source people communists. And now they have moved because of the cloud computing, uh, they have, they, their cloud computing runs on a big external. So things are changing. What I'm trying to say is, uh, open source doesn't mean that you're giving away for free. You are doing it in a way to, and if you put your name to your, if you actually share something on GitHub or something, your name is there. You are the first one who worked on it, so the credit goes to you. I might not convince you today, but we'll talk about it. It's a, it's a, it's a problem because this is, this is new, open 
science is new for everybody. We, we've not been told to work like this for the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, it's, it's all new, of course. Change is slowly coming, but it surely is. Um, and one of the biggest advantages for you, just now, to convince you, would be to focus on increasing your funding chances. Now, every funding body requires you to be an open science researcher. So, um, if you want to get more funds and continue your research, uh, there is even this very nice paper that talks about how can you um, get your grants better if you practice open science. Because most funding uh, bodies are uh, looking for that. And another thing is, when you're actually writing papers, do you really think that a PDF <coughs> can capture all the complexity of your research work? Right? Can you just write just everything in text and equations? Maybe some mathematicians could do that. But uh, can you, um, like in, in this paper, this is a biology paper, so they published their protocols in one website, and they published their tables in the other one in the data. And every time they talk about a certain protocol, they don't have to write the protocol every time again. They just can cite their protocol, which is somewhere else. So it's easy for them to write their papers. So it's, it's also a tool for you to capture all the complexity that's around your research, because you've done so much, and you want to say so much. And some papers have an eight-page limit, some papers have a ten-page limit, and it's actually a trick to put more information into your paper without exceeding page limits. That's one thing you could do. Uh, you could even uh, describe your method in a completely different uh, repository, and you can do it. And the other one is, uh, it's about being world class. If you want to be competitive in today's world, every major <coughs> university is pushing for open science and research data management uh, spreading their, uh, let's say, um, uh, investing a lot in research infrastructure, people, people. And if you talk about being competitive, I know that you're being skeptical. I can show you today's. Um, no, no, skeptical about ETH. Ah, yeah. I mean, I, I've spoken with some of them. EPFL is doing better than ETH. But uh, I've. Um, so yesterday, I'm with uh, the quantum supremacy, right? Have you, you've heard about it? Um, so this was published by Google yesterday. They talked about it and they say that quantum supremacy using a programmable superconducting processor, they say that it's going to revolutionize. It's, it's like the moment where Wright brothers invented the play. So we're talking about this. And think about a company which is as competitive as Google, who doesn't want to give away any information about their product. They want to patent this technology in this article, they give their data set that they used for this. You, can, I, don't, you don't have to believe me. You can look below the supporting documentation. This is Google AI. Data availability. They make their data available. It's the most cutting edge technology and they want to make sure that what they did they're not giving away their core technology. They're not. They are showing the data that they use to get these results. And that could be a training data set. That it's to show that these methods could work on a different data set. They're not giving away the code. So it's available, and it's two gigabytes of data. If you're interested, you can go and play with it and see what they did with it. They will tell you. They will describe everything about how they got this data, and uh, they're not going to give away their methods, of course. I mean, they're not going to give away the. But this is open science. That's what I'm trying to tell you. But this is exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. They are not going to give me access to their quantum computer. They are just giving a result demonstrating that it works. Yes. If I give my own code, no. it, it is just like yes. giving the computer. No, 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 absolutely. Like, so it's uh, the DC is between yeah. in our field of electronics. Yeah. But uh, <coughs> uh, if you are investing in, um, let's say, in um, hardware, let's say, if you are a founder, if you are something which builds things, mm -hmm. okay, uh, you even may not care about writing software like because somebody's going to do that for free for you. <coughs> and uh, in any case, whatever results, whatever designs they may make and come to the problem, you may well 
they are never going to exploit that because uh, only if you have the boundary to say the physical tools to make soft, we are talking about a very symmetric world where let's say the openness is left to the losers, let's say, okay, or to the poor guys. Uh, just like uh, the universities which have the, 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 the tools for making things which require huge investments, huge personal costs, so people devoted to those. So, well, it's tiny political. Uh, <laughs> yes, no, what I'm saying is, uh, when there was a survey actually about this exact point, and uh, in, in engineering, in social sciences, in psychology, uh, they asked, what is the biggest obstacle for open science? Uh, people thought it was technology. It's not technology. It's uh, the cultural change. People are not used to it. The, uh, the, the biggest obstacle is political, cultural, and... Uh, but yeah. what I mean is that um, uh, the discussion, the, I mean, the good life, the people who really say, I, I won't share, I, I am skeptical about open science. I was going to say, all what you said today is very, very nice and should be really uh, taught and, I mean, as a good practice and something like that. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, they assume that openness is by definition in a way. Uh, it's, it's not as cross cut as you may, uh, you may uh, try to present it in the sense that uh, it may benefit some part of society more than others and we could end up on the we will end up on the losing side in this Okay. So uh, yeah, no, no, but I I I uh, so it's not a matter of uh no. mistake. It's a matter of being very 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 wary of what you are doing. Okay, yeah, no no I, I it's also a learning moment for me to understand how to approach these topics because uh, I, 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 would, I would really love this discussion because this is where we start uh, understanding what is really needed and what can we do. Because, it, like you said, it's not black and white, but we need to be open to a level that is uh, good science and not be exploited uh, to the level of being exploited. And where do we find the balance? Absolutely. It is a very institution specific thing. We need to check what infrastructures we already have, what we can already do, and to what extent we should go. Of course, I, I fully agree. I'm 100% researcher friendly in the sense that I'm not coming here and to say, hey, 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 do this. But I'm just here to say, hey, you know, the world is doing this. But it depends a lot on the audience, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, 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 no. I mean, I, this, this is great, absolutely great. Um, I'm going to uh, just continue. Okay. So, uh, the, the reason why I, I give uh, some of them is because uh, I, I come from Tudel. We, we were, uh, uh, let's say, kind of the evangelists of open science in uh, the Netherlands. So, I, I, I do behave like an evangelist of open science, if you haven't noticed. Um, so, what, what we did was, uh, it was an interesting um, experiment because most of these universities had their research data management and open science practices happening at the library. So it was most of them were in central. So what we used to do was we had uh, every department had a person like me uh, who would help researchers for that particular department. And it was quite interesting because uh, what is data for you? What is data for you? Plots. Plots. What's data for you? Equation. And you? No, what, 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 does, what does it come for you when you talk about data? What is it? Yeah, the, the plots. And, yeah, and you? Plots. And you? Data sets. Data sets. So uh, if you ask an architecture person from, person from architecture, what is data? <coughs> and, and a mathematician or a philosopher? Equations. There, there are so many things, exactly. Everything so, which is not called and it's not documented. Documents, exactly. I mean, maybe even documents would be data for some people. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> so yes. what I'm trying to say is, like, this is the, uh, so one of the ideas we had also in, in, in Delft uh, was, was to uh, talk about um, discipline-specific data management practices. Because uh, for every discipline, it's, it's completely different. Uh, how you manage your data. Maybe if you're doing simulations, uh, you don't know which data to back up or store. Uh, are you, if you're having a simulation data every day, are you going to back up all of that? Or are you going to back up the model? 
or if it's uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 a new field again. Like we have to think about what do we back up, what do we store, what do we preserve. So what we used to do was every department had this figure, and they would help them to deal with these issues, which which was in a very luxury position because uh, all researchers would come to me or the, the other department persons to ask, hey, I have to work with the company. What do I do with my data? Okay, should I share it or should I, should I keep it? I'm going to patent my uh, uh, invention. What am I going to do? I'm going to work with really sensitive data. Uh, what am I going to do? And we had a case where they had to transfer some data from Australia. Uh, uh, what are the uh, issues? And if I'm writing a data management plan, what are the issues? So uh, I, I, I was kind of helping researchers. It was a fun role. Uh, and um, what I noticed a lot was when we sat down to write a data management plan, the researchers first thought, oh my god, I need to write a data management plan now about how do I deal with my data sets. Uh, but the second time or the third time I was speaking to them, oh, I, now I'm thinking of what data I need to collect. Because in the first year, PhD students are like, I'm going to collect all the data, and then I'm going to see what I will do with it. But uh, this is an instrument for you to actually sit down and reflect on what are we going to do with the data and uh, etc. So uh, it's it's uh, if you're interested, please have a look at what we do, what we did at TUA. It was it is an interesting uh, experiment, and almost every other university in Europe and US are working on this. So we should not be. I I know that we might be falling on the other side. I understand the concerns. But uh, we cannot uh, lag behind in this uh, field of open science. That's, all, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. And again, this is the difficult part, right? So yes, uh, I'm going to, uh, you know what? I think I'm having a, a little bit of past throat, and I'm sure your attention is also. Should we take a quick 10 minute break and come back to this interesting topic? Right? Or 10 minutes? Is that OK? Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I, I already enjoyed the lively discussions already because this is what we need. Because um, of course everybody is going towards open science, but we have to match the reality and the policy and how do we go forward. So I'm really excited that we have these conversations. So for the rest of the workshop, what I would like to propose is I will try to because discussions are more important than the content at this moment also. So what we're going to do is, uh, I'm going to try to finish my uh, slides in 15-30 minutes. We will have further discussion and then our library colleagues will talk about um, the, the things you need to do for uh, H2020 funding, the open access policy of uh, Polytechnical, etc. So the last time we, we uh, uh, when I was evangelizing about the selfish uh, benefits of um, um, researchers, one of the key pain points in this whole thing is what about my career? Uh, I would like to publish more, I would like to do, uh, because uh, when I want to get a promotion, when I want to go abroad, uh, they're going to look at my publications. So uh, what should I do? Why should I do open science only for others? And what about my career? This is a question uh, I, I've gotten so many times, and I, I probably everybody would be having the same uh, questions. Uh, but I have to say that things are changing uh, slowly but surely. Whether we like it or not, uh, the funding bodies are moving in this direction. And uh, we have to be prepared. Because um, first of all, first of all, even before funding bodies, all the important journals, uh, uh, Nature, Science, uh, all uh, the, the top higher ones, are requesting uh, data. I, I mean, uh, because maybe it's not easy to read. I'm going to read it from here. Uh, an inherent principle of publication is that others should be able to replicate and build upon the author's published claims. A condition of publication in a Nature Research Journal is that authors are required to make materials, data, code, associated protocols promptly available to readers without undue qualifications. So uh, it's also a matter of, if you want to actually publish in very top uh, journals, you will have to find ways to publish your code, your data. So I was just having a very interesting discussion with the professor about like, yeah, it's my life's work. I'm doing so much and I don't want to put it out there. Uh, one way to do it would be to like give an input data, output data, uh, give your workflows, give your research methods. 
it gives an opportunity for people to understand what you're doing. So that's what they mean by making making it reproducible. So somebody <coughs> wants tries to uh, work on the code. So already, even before funding bodies, the main journals are looking at uh, asking for code and data. That's that's something you cannot avoid if you want to publish in good journals from now. And to be ready to be having to be ready to publish your data and code, you cannot do it when you write your paper. You need to do it from the beginning. Otherwise, you will not know where your files are, which where to publish. So that's why when I started to say be smart and efficient from the beginning in terms of folders, files, whatever, uh, try to be consistent. So when you do get to publish your data set, whenever you decide to. Uh, like I said, open data is not equals to open. You could also keep it restricted. Uh, it means as uh, open as possible, as closed as necessary. So if it's really uh, not, if you're not able to share it at all, then if there are some restrictions, of course. But um, make sure to manage your data across your life cycle to publish in the very top journals. And decision makers are pushing for change. European Commission is thinking of completely re-evaluating the way researchers are awarded. It might not be in future that publications will not be the only way forward. It, it might be uh, one of the uh, aspects, but uh, open science practices are, uh, there is even a framework to acknowledge open science practices. I don't know if uh, some of you have heard about the credit system while writing papers. Have you ever heard about this? So credit system, some of the journals are adopting it, where you don't have first author, second author, third author, which happens usually, but you have somebody who did the data analysis, somebody who did the uh, data cleaning, or who, who did the writing. So there are some roles that you can attribute to, uh, to different people, so you actually recognize them for exactly what they did instead of just looking at reviewing the paper. So that's, uh, that's happening already in some journals. And uh, there are also a lot of discussion about uh, how do we reward, it, reward uh, researchers in terms of more qualitative incentives. Like, uh, can we give incentives to publish uh, negative results? Recently, a professor in the, uh, uh, won a grant to actually reproduce papers and look at negative results as well. So there, there, there are a lot of incentives for uh, doing open science practices. And, and the direction is this way, whether we like it or not. We have to follow this. And um, there are also many things, uh, uh, the funders, like for the FP9, they're already thinking that this will be part of the, uh, by design, they want to do open science by design. So, of course, publishing in open access journals is, is kind of a given that that is already happening more and more, uh, using fair data principles. Uh, adopting quality standards in open data management and open data sets, making use of open data. So there are also incentives to, for researchers to not just uh, share the data, but try to reproduce others' data, so try to reuse it. So, that, so if you uh, try to build upon other research data, uh, you know, others, uh, you might have better chance of uh, even funding. I'm talking it in a very practical terms here. I'm not talking about the great importance of uh, it. It does already exist. There are some specific funding in Horizon Europe, in Horizon 2020 now, that allow researchers to use research from previous funded project to get money to go to further. Absolutely. So it does already exist. Yes, absolutely. No, they might make it even the default of yes. the future. That's what I, what, what I was trying to say is it's, it, it will happen uh, sooner or later. And you can also secure funding for open science activities. Uh, I, uh, I was recently helping out uh, a, a research project which was actually asking a Marikuri fund to train researchers in research data management practices. So first off, we learn about, uh, I don't know, uh, developing a data was repository for university. So it's on the data engineering side. So uh, a lot of things are happening around research uh, open science. It's not necessarily about data, it's about infrastructure, it's about, it's about policies, it's about training, it's about people. So uh, it, it, it is moving in this direction. And there is a whole collection of academic jobs that mention open science practices. There is even a repository that takes the list of open science jobs. As you can see, this uh, was by a German researcher. So <laughs> they, uh, in, in Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, uh, open science is being considered as an asset for research.
research by Tyron. I have personally seen ads that says that we prefer candidates who can uh, continue our open science efforts in our institution. And this happens in pockets, of course it's not an institutional thing, but uh, the University of Ghent in Belgium, uh, whose rector is now the president of CESAR as well, uh, he was one of the first to say that we do not want to hire people based on citations and papers alone. We are going to look at their comprehensive profile, we're going to look into how they do their data. We don't care if they have 10 papers in very high journals, but we're going to look at the quality more than quantity. It's slowly happening, and it, it is happening all over the world. And if you're interested, you can also check out all these job profiles which mention open science. Some say we will fully support open science. Some say we prefer if you already had some, uh, uh, if you can show that you are good at open science. And uh, it's, it's a big list of jobs, and it, it, they, they are improving. And what's also more interesting is, open science could be an alternative career choice for researchers if you, are in, if you still want to stay in academia and not in a, a tenure track position. There are so many jobs across Europe. There is uh, ranging from somebody like a data steward like mine, or to a data librarian, or a subject matter specialist, or a data engineer, or a data manager, or a data scientist, a uh, research data scientist. The most beautiful one I heard from the University of Oxford last week was research reproducibility expert. That was, the, that was the latest job. So if you are interested in the science career, so do advancing science, it could also be a multi career option. It's, it's just pragmatically speaking, uh, because we know that the percentage of PhDs who reach, receive tenure track positions are very uh, small. So if you still want to stay in academia, it's, it's a fantastic uh, uh, job uh, alternative career as well. So for, for researchers. Uh, and there is a very interesting role. It's called research software engineer. It's, I've seen it in three or four countries now, UK, Germany, and the Netherlands. So research software engineers are actually researchers themselves. They have a PhD or a postdoc in either computer science or very hardcore uh, certain branches. And what they do is they help other researchers, like historians or uh, geography or urban uh, planners, to um, help them create sustainable software for their research. So uh, they, they're kind of coordinated. Um, they're either within the university to help them with the uh, research software, or they are an international pool of experts where they get some co-financing for helping out on certain projects. So uh, research software engineer is also kind of uh, a role that's, that's becoming uh, quite uh, popular. And one thing I want to say before starting discussing with you is uh, the reason why we have to also critically think about open science is the very credibility of academics today. Because with the amount of information we have, uh, everybody thinks they're an expert. Uh, and there, there is even a, um, a big uh, controversial statement that said that's the end of the expert. Why should we listen to the experts? And when Brexit happened, uh, the, the Michael Gove said, Let's, why should we listen to all the experts that things are going to go bad? It's going to be perfect. And look where we are, three and a half years from now. So uh, we are kind of living in the post-truth world where uh, the difference between reality and fake is kind of going. So that makes us even more in a difficult situation to prove that what we are doing is credible. So researchers have much more pressure in showing to the world that what we are doing is credible. So I, I, I have no other way. I don't think there is a looking back. It will be a difficult. Uh, it might be difficult, it might be easy, it might have incentives, it might not. But we need to remember that there is no looking back. This is the way forward. We need to do something. We need to find ways. We need to be creative. Uh, and what we need to do is think about uh, how do we navigate these complex issues together with all our stakeholders. So it's the only way forward right now, I have to say. And just to give you a quick recap of what we're talking, then we'll have a nice discussion of different things. I would, because uh, the whole point of a workshop, otherwise we could have a video recording and forget about it. We would like to talk more about it. So today uh, we just talked about uh, why open science is just science done, done right. 
uh, some selfish benefits regarding more <coughs> pragmatically for researchers regarding funding, about the way the world is going to be more efficient, to be more, uh, to be the front runner, because a lot of uh, universities uh, are, are optimistic and they're going forward with this and we cannot lag behind. And if we, and research is kind of a mobile thing, right? It's an international thing. You want to go do a postdoc at MIT or Caltech, or uh, and you need to have, uh, it's also about raising research standards. And uh, we, we've talked a little bit of a, a few practical things. The reason um, I'm here today, as uh, this is my first uh, official assignment as a researcher. So I am the newest Open Science Fellow. Uh, I'm advising, uh, sorry, first help me. <laughs> the first one. <laughs> so Federica, I, I met Federica last year at the conference, and we really uh, talked about it, and I was going from the tune anyway, and we thought, why don't I work a little bit on open science, because I'm really passionate about this topic. There are a lot of challenges. There's a lot of need for awareness, more than uh, telling them what to do, just the importance of open science, even practically for you as a career, uh, researcher. When you're looking for funds, when you're looking for a change of careers, when you're looking about yourself, uh, why do you have to pay attention to this and what can you do to improve your chances? And demonstrating the value and trying to change some culture, of course, it, it is an uphill battle, I understand. But I'm, I'm, that's why it's challenging and that's why it's exciting. And uh, like I said, we, we, we have to catch up. And uh, what I will be doing mainly would be collaborating with different US stakeholders mainly with, uh, of course, Federica, researchers, of course, uh, with the IT people, because they, they, they are wonderful, uh, yes, and right there, who helped us. <laughs> uh, so, no, they, they, they already do a lot of things. Um, <laughs> so, uh, especially for the infrastructure side, uh, we also will work together with the legal people on uh, um, data and uh, uh, agreements. We'll also work with the technology transfer people because when do we share the data before you patent it or uh, all this needs to be coordinated. And uh, also with the research office because they are writing the grants for Horizon 2020, how do we cost for all these things? Because in the proposals you can actually uh, request for money for uh, research data management and how can we work on that. So I will be working on uh, working together with all these stakeholders to give some more consistent information to researchers that you can still do open science and get your patents and get your competitive advantages and try to think of ways of writing contracts with companies, try to think of ways of uh, being as open as possible and as close as necessary. All this takes a lot of time and effort and we will just be scratching the surface now, really. Uh, and the other thing, based on all this information, we would like to think of a policy roadmap because last week we were reading about um, a funding proposal that asked, uh, uh, for this fund, does your university have a data policy? So we don't have one. We, we need one. Yes. We need uh, one. Uh, so, uh, and also, uh, ethics is another thing, research integrity and ethics. So that's, it's all related. And uh, advice to researchers, uh, this would be a bit more limited because uh, I will only be here two days a week, so I have to do a lot of uh, things in two days a week. Uh, what advice I can give is, if you're writing a data management plan and you're not sure of how to, or you want somebody to take a look at it and see that I write all the things necessary, or can I improve it to show my chances of, uh, uh, or, or show that I'm able to manage my data better, I can help you with that, about the wordings and about the strategies to write it. I can do that. Uh, I'm not going to write it for you, of course. I can review it. Um, and also, if you have questions like, oh, personal data, or uh, I, I can try to be kind of a general practitioner where I can answer 80% of your questions or 75% of your questions. And for the really specialists, I will probably know who to ask uh, so that you don't have to go to 10 different places to get your answers. And uh, my idea is to be fully researcher friendly. I was a researcher myself, uh, I am, my current role is a researcher. So I completely understand all the frustrations of researchers. If somebody had told me during my postdoc do research data management, I would have shouted their face. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I grew, I evolved, <laughs> because um, it, it, it was something, um, it's important and it's, it's the future, so we, we I know that uh, researchers will be the first ones to figure this out, but once they do it, it, uh, it, it, it hopefully it will be a bright future. And in future, uh, what we want to do is something more, a little bit more hands-on. Today was kind of a, 
awareness session, like a bit more on uh, why am I here to kind of introduce my role also, and also to kind of give you uh, a, a flavor of what open science is and what small things you can do to uh, improve your impact. Think about uh, when you're thinking about how to share your data. And the next workshop we hope to plan uh, is about actually writing a data management plan, like sitting down and writing down. Uh, <coughs> When I write my data management plan, how do I make my data fair? What does fair mean? What is findable? What are the tools I need to have to make my data findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable? We, we, we need it. Because if, if it was all today, it would be completely confusing. Uh, and also the other one we want to have was on personal data management. Like if you're collecting sensitive data, if you're from biomedical engineering, or even uh, if you're working on autonomous uh, driving vehicles, you might be capturing camera data uh, on uh, real people, uh, and how do you navigate this, and how can you um, be responsible uh, while doing so. And also, uh, one more thing we would like to do is talk about uh, what does open science mean with industry collaborations. So how do we, because uh, Federica is already working with Cesar on this topic, uh, on what the university is doing for collaborating. And there is also, in this, there is also a topic for open hardware. Have you heard about open hardware? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a new focus of social science. So, like, uh, 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 um, an example would be that uh, uh, genetic engineers, or they have a process of combing the DNA. They, they literally need a device to comb the DNA. It's a piece of plastic, and since it's patented, it's 360 euros. So, it's really a piece of plastic, uh, and so, people, but we can do this, you know, ourselves. That's how the open hardware movement started. So it's about kind of devising uh, instruments that uh, don't that don't require five thousand euros or ten thousand euros of uh, money to purchase a cluster. Uh, <clears throat> so that's also uh, something we can uh, probably have an invited talk, or we can think of something like that. And the other exciting thing we want to do is data and software carpentries. It's more on the education side. So teaching um, students or researchers Python, Git, version control, uh, uh, process automation, right from the beginning. So it could be like, a, uh, it's a two-day course usually. It's kind of a sustainable way of teaching because it's a, it's a voluntary thing. So you kind of train a pool of researchers. You become a certified carpentry uh, instructor. And the obligation to keep your certification is you need to give one course per year. Or, uh, or you can uh, you can also discuss with it, and it's a two-day course. So from morning to afternoon, you work on uh, a Unix shell, a Python, a Bash, uh, uh, a command runs, and you kind of do both for data and uh, carpentry. The lesson plans are already there; they're very extensive. Uh, the, the only thing is, you need to make small additions. You need to add something more to the lesson. So the preparation is, is a bit less uh, because uh, it's being improved by thousands of instructors around the world. So all the lesson plans are open. So it's it's a quite nice way of uh, teaching a consistent uh, curriculum on uh, research computing to researchers. And it's interesting because you might expect like research from my team to have um, uh, these skills. But there are three or four software carpentries happening in MIT every year. Uh, so we started it in the Netherlands. It was a very good success. We, we always had full uh, classes because uh, maybe chemical engineers, civil engineers, or uh, architecture faculty uh, students uh, who, who probably need software, but they're not sure what to do with it. Or even computer science students, some of them, uh, in the bachelors, they, they had this as a first year course to, uh, as fundamentals. So it's, it's a very value-based, low-cost, low-effort, sustainable thing. But it's kind of a community-based community thing. So another thing what we want to do is to kind of have data champions in different um, departments, just to have a reference person to just talk to. Hey, uh, what do you think of this? There's an event here. Do you want to go? Uh, there is some funding for this open science activity. I think what you're doing is very similar to. Uh, so just to encourage already existing open science practitioners around the university, uh, identify them and actually, you know, put them up. And of course, we have very big ambitions of having a, a blog once in a while to talk about interviewing such data champions, why do they do what they do, 
etc. etc. And many more things. Again, like I'm, I'm already, I'm an optimist. I'm an, um, I'm, my uh, pseudonym is Pan Ross. If you have heard about Voltaire's Pan Ross, he's an incorrigible optimist. So that's, uh, and I, I believe in hope. Uh, and I think things will change. And of course, we'll keep you informed. So this is my contact. Uh, it's uh, shamini.purapati at polito.it. I'm also active on Twitter. I also wrote a blog about why I chose this road. Uh, as from a researcher, why I decided to become an open science uh, champion. So if you're interested, uh, if, if you, you can read why I, I took, took up this job. And um, the only thing is, uh, I work two days a week in Polytechnico, usually on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So uh, if you have any questions, or uh, I, my office is upstairs at the museum. I, I'm usually there if I'm not uh, away for conferences. The other days I'm working at the IT incubator uh, on my own company. Uh, it's very little to do with open science, but uh, I'm using a lot of um, knowledge I got in trying to be as open as possible and close as necessary. Uh, because, um, uh, and then, I just would like to thank you and I you uh, ask you uh, to continue discussions for another 20 minutes or so um, by thinking about Goodhart's law. The reason why I have to be here to convince everybody else on open science is because this is what happened with impact factors, this is what happened with publications and how the systematic approach. No, we scientists are great at doing science, but we don't know how to uh, fund this science very well. The meta science is missing, kind of. So this is part of the meta science, where we are trying to shake things up one thing at a time. But uh, it will take uh, a lot of effort, it will take a lot of collaborations. Uh, there will be a lot of resistance, but uh, we have to keep moving forward. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, we will continue talking. We are not going to stop here, for sure. Thank you.